All right, welcome to another edition of the CSA uh, Cybersecurity Podcast. And this is one of our security leader series, where, as you know, if you've heard some of our previous editions, we interview a wide variety of security leaders and find out uh, what was their career path like? How did they end up where they are? What are things that any of us can learn from them about uh, careers in this space? We know we have a lot of people moving into the space and people who want to move up and they want to find out what their opportunities are and how do they navigate to those opportunities. And there's no better way than to get some mentorship for some great security leaders out there, which leads me to an easy segue to a great uh, pioneer in this space, Andrew Ginter, VP of Industrial Security, an author, well-known industrial cybersecurity expert, podcast host, uh, multiple credentials in the industry. Many of you probably know Andrew. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you, Derek. That's a a very kind introduction, a very generous one. Well, it's well-deserved. There's uh, I I use the word pioneer, and a few of you are like, well, I don't know if that's me. I'm like, yep, you can't go back very many years. And you guys, some of you have been doing this for a while when you were standing on the street corner saying, this is a big problem area. Uh, Now there's more people who get it, uh, but some of you were early in in saying, hey, we've got to really work on this. And um, I think you were one of of those people. So on behalf of society, thank you. (laughs) Oh, you're welcome. It it sounds like a fancy way of saying I'm old, but yes, I'll take it. (laughs) It's all perspective, right? So I like to say that security uh, people are kind of superheroes in their own way, at least to our bias. So every superhero has a backstory. Let's, Let's get your backstory. I know you You've done a variety of things. And I think there's even a company name with your name in it going back many years ago. So um, we'll go back even before that. Where are you, where are you from? Where do you hail from? Uh, I'm from Calgary. I mean, I was uh, raised on a farm outside of Calgary. I, I came to the big city. You know, to me, Calgary was the big city. <laughs> a lot of other people, you know, it's a million people. It was uh, it, to, to a lot of other people. It's a small town. But, you know, to me, it was the big city. And, uh, you know, I've been here ever since I, I set down roots. The way I got started in the industry, you know, my story, I have to say, to a large extent, is happenstance. I did not do this consciously, but in hindsight, what I I see that I've seen myself having done is it didn't matter where I worked. If there was something important that needed doing, I would step up. I would volunteer to do it. So I wound up doing a lot of stuff that that nobody wanted to do. I mean, my very first job in the the computer field, I was maintaining 100,000 lines of assembly code. Uh, Apparently, the job had been offered to half of the graduating class in the the computer science department, and they'd all rejected it because nobody wants to do maintenance. They all wanted to do development. And, you know, nobody wanted to do maintenance of macro 11 assembler code. But, you know, I said, I had a math degree. I said, "It's it's a job. Let's do it. And, you know, I I guess I did it well. I got promoted. But, you know, it didn't matter if it was maintenance. Uh, You know, I wound up working for an outfit. You know, well, you've heard of the outfit HP. I wound up working for HP in a little skunk works. Yes. Develop data product. And again, I gravitated towards the work that nobody else wanted to do. There were parts of the product that urgently needed maintenance. And uh, everybody hated it. Everybody wanted to be working on the new development. So I said, sure, it needs doing. I'll do it. Let's do it. And wound up an expert on some very important parts of the product that urgently needed maintenance. So, you know, as an expert, now you start getting called on into bigger roles because you become a success. (laughs) And so, you know, I wound up at one point, I wound up, uh, you know, for two years doing the, uh, the ISO 9000 QA initiative. Quality assurance. Nobody wants to do quality assurance. That's testing. That's that's not development. We want development. I said it needs doing. I did it. I built a test infrastructure that, to my knowledge, they're still using. Um, you know, this was back before the days of agile development, where sort of everything instinctively included it, its own test infrastructure. But again, you go with what's important, and you you wind up getting dragged into important areas and execute well. You know, in my experience. You get promoted, you you move up through the ranks, you have greater opportunities. This is so you know, I got pulled into SCADA security because the company made a strategic decision. This was, you know, HP got spun off to Agilent, Agilent spun us off to Verano. Verano eventually renamed to become Industrial Defender. And in part of that process, made a strategic decision to invest in SCADA security. I was not part of that project initially. That was a big development project. I wound up doing maintenance on 
the SCADA product on the uh, middleware product that was connecting to SAP, but again, became an expert on those technologies, some of which were being used in the new space. You know, eventually I wound up architect, I wound up eventually uh, chief technology officer responsible for all development and, you know, evangelism as well for the, uh, the industrial defender product. So I followed the work that needed doing and and here I am in a sense. If I may real quick, post, you know, yeah. post industrial defender, um, I hung up a shingle. I tried to do the consulting thing for a while. And, you know, Lira Frankel, the CEO and co-founder at Waterfall, persuaded me of the error of my ways. And I signed with Waterfall as as their VP industrial security. <laughs> I love it. That's hey, that's every entrepreneur's job. Yeah. Gotta get the gotta get the great people to say, come with us. Yeah, go back a little bit. I'm always curious and I ask everybody. Where did technology uh, and then specifically cybersecurity even intersect with you? Is there something prior to, you know, graduating high school? Is there early theme or no, it came later and this is where it kind of intersected? You know, I was a, a, a tinkerer in my youth, but, you know, I, I grew up on a farm. I was kind of isolated from the the mainstream friends. I, I never had, uh, you know, one of the, the Apples or the TRS-80s. I did have a programmable calculator that I spent ridiculous amounts of time with. Texas Instrument? Was it Texas Instruments? Well, it, it was. It was Texas Instruments. It was. Well, they were the kings of, of programmable calculators. That's right. I wound up doing a math degree. The truth is that in first year, you know, in, in the University of Calgary, before I could specialize in math, I had to do a year of what's called general sciences. So I took a little of everything. And if you want to move on into the sciences, one of the required courses obviously was calculus. Another required course was Fortran for the natural sciences. That's how old I am. Fortran. <laughs> and I, you know, I kid you not, I guess my one of my pieces of advice to people who are to young folk is ask for advice. Because I did not. I took Fortran for the natural sciences and I just had a blast. It was the most fun I'd had in school, period. On the end, it was, it was on a mainframe computer. On the end, they gave me uh, 20 second chunks of time on this mainframe, 20 CPU seconds at a go. Yeah. And I used it to calculate the first 10,000 digits of pi. I wrote the program in Fortran and I had so much fun. I thought, you know, should I switch my, my plan here? Instead of doing uh, math, should I switch to computer science? And I did not ask anyone. You know, I thought this too. I thought, Andrew, you're a man of the world. Is anyone going to pay you to have this much fun for the rest of your career? <laughs> and I said, no, that's not how the world works. The world, you know, the world doesn't pay you to have fun. Stick with the math. It's hard. People pay you to do hard things. Yeah. So I did. I finished four years of, of math and I had a couple of courses in, in the course of that where, you know, I dabbled in computers again and always had so much fun. And my first job straight out of school, I didn't know, you know, I actually went down to the to the, uh, the computer science, not computer science, the, the computer services department. This was the, the the department that served workstations and connectivity and, yeah. you know, was the infrastructure and uh, asked for an hour of CPU time on one of the mainframes. And they said, what are you going to do with it? And I said, this weird computer thing that, you know, was a mathematical puzzle that's called the Pentamino puzzle, if you want to look it up. You know, there's allegedly 2,300 solutions. I said, and I read this in a science fiction book. I said, there's no, there's not. It took me two hours to find one lousy solution. I said, there's no way there's 2,300 solutions. But to prove it, you know, I would write a program. This is, you know, where in the end, they asked me about this program I was going to write and what was I going to do with this computer time. And in the end, they offered me a job. I said, talk to me about this job. They said, look, if you're working for the department, there's spare time on the mainframe. You can have the spare time. When, a, when perk. The a perk. That's right. Yeah. I said, sure. Tell me about this job. And I wound up doing maintenance on 100,000 lines of assembly code, which had no external documentation and very little internal documentation. And most of that was wrong, but it yeah. was important work. It was crashing four times a day. And every time it crashed, it took down 100 users. So we fixed it. And so, um, you know, to my point, I, uh, you know, A, I fell into this. And B, if you run into something you really like, and, and if I made the punchline, be darned if they didn't pay me to come to work every day and have fun. So the punchline is ask for advice. Okay, don't 
don't work it too long your own like I did because you know at, at one point I was working at HP and you know I told my wife at the time I said uh, you know I'm having so much fun doing this and you know even better than that they feed me donuts once a day at coffee <laughs> another perk <laughs> I said I said I would do this just for the donuts yeah because don't tell them that <laughs> Because I was having so much fun. So yeah. ask for advice, get advice, because, you know, the, 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 what seems logical to a young person isn't, isn't necessarily the right way forward. Yeah. Well, that's a good, that's, you know, we're, I'm always looking for walkaway value. We've got people in our, uh, in our broad, very deep membership base that are, you know, that are um, entry level or that are looking to migrate somehow and make, make changes. And the questions are commonly like, what move should I make next? And so I think that's sort of, that, there's one little uh, nugget from today already, which is uh, this idea around advice. And that has surfaced in other, you know, in other discussions, mentorship, you know, having mentors, being a mentor. You know, and that's a good segue. I'll ask you, you know, at what place has mentorship played a role in your career? The clearest mentor I remember is Ron Derrick. He's long since retired. Um, he was my development manager. When I was at uh, at HP working on the the SCADA product, the clearest thing I remember I, I didn't I don't remember going to him for advice on a regular basis. But what I remember is going to him on a regular basis with problems, technical problems, people problems, whatever. It seems to me in hindsight that every time I went to him with a problem, he would look me in the eye and say, "Andrew, what are our options here?" And I'm going, "I don't know." He said, "Go away, figure out what our options are." And come back with a recommendation and a rationale for the recommendation. And I would do that. And I'd come back and sometimes he'd accept my recommendation. And sometimes he'd say, no, 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 you got the analysis wrong. This is more important than that. We need to do this. But it got me thinking. It got me working through, you know, asking the question, what does the business need? And digging up the data sources as to what are the needs of the business? What are the priorities of the business? What are the, the, the constraints on the business? so that I can make a recommendation that's credible. And I found that extremely useful. And in the end, if I may, Ron eventually switched from development into marketing, defining the product, understanding, you know, what does the market need next? Mm -hmm. And so when my own career went from, you know, leading a development team to CTO evangelism to, you know, BP industrial security, which is everything from writing books to speaking at conferences to you know, helping out with sales from time to time. It's kind of a marketing role, you know, because I'd seen that trajectory moving from develop the product to help people figure out what needs to come next and why. It was a very natural migration for me because my mentor had made, you know, had, had demonstrated that uh, that career trajectory to me already. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, you know, it, it's interesting as I interview each of you, there's these different paths. You, you you get into the industrial path very, very soon, but it isn't necessarily, well, let's see, is, is Industrial Defender the, the, the first for you, or does Hewlett Packard, stuff you're doing at Hewlett Packard introduce the, the, the operating technology or ICS or whatever you wanted to call it, whatever it was called then, is that where you start to get introduced to that, that type of technology versus traditional uh, IT technology? I got started. I mean, I got started actually working on the Multix operating system. I mean, first I did the... Well, if you want the, the the whole thing, but I won't go into detail. I did uh, a couple of years maintenance on Macro 11, X25 packet switching technology to you know keep the communications going for the university. I did a couple of years. Uh, they the, the university rented me out because I'd become an expert on X25, which nobody nowadays uses, but you know e Ethernet wins. But back then, you know X25 was a contender. They rented me out to Develcon which was uh, uh, an outfit that was developing some X25 technology. And so I uh, you know, led the team that developed uh, product for the, uh, the for Develcon. And then, um, you know, I moved on. Well, I did a little bit in between. I, I uh, did some work on the Honeywell Multix operating system, which is a military grade. It's uh, uh, C2, no, B, B2 certified in the, the old orange book criteria, which is very hard to do. It's very hard to certify any piece of software to, to that, uh, that degree of, of security. So I, I got exposed to some host security concepts then, you know, drifted into um, 
control systems. I worked for a, an outfit in Calgary that was developing control system. I went back and did my uh, a master's degree. I thought, you know, this I'd been seven years in the computer industry. I thought I should get some credentials here. What I have is a math degree and uh, got into uh, SCADA development, real-time application platform. RTAP is the product name. It's still around. HP developed it as sort of a skunk works in Calgary and then spun it off to Agilent and so on. And now, I'm curious, get, any any real recognition or discussion around security yet amongst you and your colleagues? Yet. Nope, okay. not yet. So yeah. here's so with that sort of background, I had I had a taste of security with the, the Honeywell Multics. The, the short story is this. You know, I tell people, uh, it's sort of in summary, I developed SCADA product for five, eight years. And then the important thing was to switch to SAP connectivity because ITOT integration, well, that was the beginning of ITOT integration. And so I developed for Agilent uh, a product called Enterprise Link that connected control systems to SAP, thereby connecting a lot of industrial networks yeah. to enterprise networks and contributing to the cybersecurity problems that now plague many industries. So you helped break the air gap. I helped break it, yes. <laughs> and then, you know, the, the again, I uh, in a sense, I, I followed what was important. The business made, made a decision to to switch to security, and so I, you know, I followed that decision. But in my short bio, you know, what I say is, look, I developed control system product, I developed connectivity product, I connected a lot of networks, I contributed to the problem. Then I got religion. I wound up chief technology officer at Industrial Defender trying to solve some of these security problems. And again, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't so much a conscious decision I made. It was that the business had decided to uh, that this was the next strategic opportunity. And so, uh, you know, I kept the old business, the control systems and the, the middleware going for a while. <laughs> while you know, another team of, of people much keener than I was to do development started development. But in the end, I wound up running it. And in part, you know, it's because of writing skills. It's because of research skills. So the the, the master's degree helped a lot, not just well, in terms of you got that. a credential to your name, but okay. in terms so of teaching. You another, to... another nugget, you have writing. Another guest talked about communication yes. skills. Let's talk about writing skills. Uh, why don't you dive a little deeper on that? Because that's people right. asking themselves, that's not just entry level, right? That's anybody moving looking to some sort of progression path, that's going to be, that's going to be important Absolutely. to get a factor in. Absolutely. If you have ambitions to uh, be designing product that other people are going to build, you want to be the designer or the architect, you've got to be able to express yourself. Forget that. Sort of the step before that, my first step towards that was not product architect. My first step towards that was project manager. Manage the spreadsheets, the schedules. I was horrible at it. You know, my projects were... <laughs> <laughs> way over. I hated this. And so I, you know, read for a year, I read everything I could on software engineering. I wound up developing a methodology that for us, at least in the context of our SCADA development, we could reliably predict how long these projects were going to take. No one else had ever done that, but, you know, I hated failure. And so I read everything I could and, and developed. But even when you're a project manager focused on the spreadsheets, you still have to communicate project status to your boss and your boss's boss and the other people who care enormously about the budget that you're burning through here. That's a communication skill. You've got to be able to, to, to summarize projects. You've got to you know, write an, an email once a week. You got, and it has to make sense. Moving on from that to you know, project architect, again, I hated waste. And so what I determined was the most efficient way to explain to a development team what to build is to write a draft user manual. You have to do that anyway. And if you got a user manual, the developers go, oh, well then, I would need to build all of this. And you haven't done a design that's going to be thrown away once the code is written. You haven't written a specification that's going to be thrown away once the code is written. You've written the draft user manual. And uh, again, to do that, you've got to be able to write in a way that the developers understand that the end users hopefully eventually understand. I mean, it's a draft of the user manual. The tech writer takes it and, and redoes it. But writing, you know, you've got to be able to communicate if you want to advance in your career. There we go. 
Speaking of writing, yes, indeed. I just pulled these off of this shelf back here just for this call. And uh, so I, I, my, my, my favorite books there are books that I know the authors. And I have a few of those. But these, uh, you, you've taken writing, you've gone, I guess, you know, one could say to the next next level. You wrote these, right? Yes, indeed. I did. Talk about, talk about that as an experience. You know, what had you done this before? Or are these, these are the first two? Or those are the first two. And uh, the red one's the first one. And, um, it was quite the experience. The uh, and the, the the current book doesn't quite look like that. You have a collector's item that was sort of in the first print run. This one no, no, or this one? The red one. The red one's ah. a collector's item because the in the second print run we put an image into that white space. We said that's too much white space. Can you see that? That's what oh, the yes. Everything oh, that's after. So interesting. Yeah, everything yeah. after the first print run looked like that. So. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, I, I started writing that book when I started with uh, with Waterfall Security. Made almost no progress for like six years. And it was, you know, in hindsight, and now every, I suppose everyone has different different uh, barriers to, to, to getting stuff written. But the barrier for me was I lost track of my audience. I started writing, you know, saying... Uh, you know, security practitioners need to know this stuff. And then I said, yes, but so do, you know, business decision makers and C-levels. And, yeah. and I lost track of my audience. And I could not figure out what, I could not figure out what to write. I could not, you know, I could not figure out if I write this, this audience will get it, but that audience won't. And it just, yeah. I lost track. And, you know, I threw away two versions of the book. And, you know, was stuck again the third time and uh, read an article in IEEE Spectrum. Now, I don't know if you read IEEE Spectrum. It's sort of the high end of industry publication. It's not peer reviewed. Okay, it's, the, it's, it's sort of the very lowest end of academic peer review. But IEEE has a lot of academic publications. They do a lot of yeah. research. This is their high end magazine written by staff. And I read an article in there on the Ukraine attack, 2016. And the article was just wrong from one end to the other. The conclusion of the article was that these distribution utilities in Ukraine were not well enough secured. They urgently, desperately needed better intrusion detection in their substations. I'm going, I have nothing against intrusion detection. You know, I worked for Industrial Defender, an intrusion detection vendor. But to confuse detection with protection so thoroughly, I mean, I could see intrusion detection having a, a role to play in helping to prevent the attack in the industrial network, even in the IT network. But to say in the substation network, that's where you needed to do the intrusion detection. What good was that going to do you? The, the bad guys were, you know, were, were navigating through the HMI, turning off the power. And their cohorts were logging into the substations using passwords that they'd stolen long ago and erasing the hard drives. So you get an alert from the substation saying, help, help, someone's logging in. Oh, never mind. Hard drives eh, erased. And a minute later, you get an alert from another substation. How's this going to help you? And so I decided then and there that what I needed to write, I threw out my current effort, which I'd stalled on anyway. I decided then and there, um, I need to write the shortest, simplest book that anyone can read. And having read it, cannot in good conscience put together an article like this ever again. And so I wrote the Red Book. It turns out in hindsight, it was controversial because I said, this is the wrong way to think about the problem. This is the right way to think about the problem. It was a, I've heard people tell me, I've heard people tell me that the, the Red Book was a work of sales. And I said, but I only mentioned Waterfall, my employer in there once in a footnote. How can it be a work of sales? They said, no, 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 Andrew, you are arguing from front to end for a certain perspective, a certain way of looking at security. It's an argument from one end to the, you're selling an idea and I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. But because I used criticism of certain existing perspectives, because I criticized existing practice, it was a very controversial book. 
You know, I had I had experts tell me, Andrew, I disagree so fundamentally with your premise that I could not finish reading the book. But you know, really, what it highlighted is the discrepancy in in uh, practice out there. Because I had other experts tell me, Andrew, it must have taken weeks or months of your life to write all this stuff down. I hate to tell you this, but it's all obvious. What would possess you to spend this much of your life documenting the self-evidently true? And the bizarre thing is that these people would, you know, I would see them come out, you know, sit, talking to each other at a conference and, you know, saying words, nodding heads as if they would agree with each other. But they mean entirely different things. They would say, you know, patching is important. Yes, it is. Now their heads go away. What the mon- one meant is patching is important because all we have is software. And there's information coming into these networks from all over, through the firewalls, on the USB keys. All information is potential attacks. The only hope we have of keeping anywhere near secure is to patch at least the known vulnerabilities. You know, so you it, it's it's kind of... It's a no-brainer. Of course you need to do it. And the other people said, yeah, patching is important because we have so thoroughly locked down our systems, nothing gets into them. But it doesn't matter that nothing gets into them. There's no such thing as a secure system. Security is a spectrum. It's a continuum, not a binary state. And so even though we are completely locked down, we still need to patch sooner or later because you know you never know if you've missed something. They mean two entirely different things. They think they're agreeing with each, with each other, and they disagree fundamentally on how to secure their systems. So, you know, that's a long answer. When I wrote the Black Book, I deliberately tried to do a less controversial thing. I deliberately tried to say, what do the world's most secure sites do? Document that. It's a journal. This is a work of journalism. You don't have to agree with what they do, but you should really know what they do because it's quite different from what you do. If you want to use any of those techniques, well, here they are. Now you've seen them at least. Yeah. So that's less a very interesting approach. It, it it neuters immediately some of the antibodies that form because it's more science, you know, it's like you said, it's it's journalism, it's scientific measurement. It's like, hey, I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm just this is what best practices that these are, you know, people take from what you want from it, but you can't really say, you know, that's right. oh, that's crazy. That's yeah. right. So I mean, when it comes to writing. You have to write if you want to advance in your career in my books and, uh, you know, practice it, get better at it over time. And, you know, I had an ambition to write one or more books, uh, you know, in my career. And, uh, you know, when the when I finally figured out how to do that, it was uh, it was great. And in a sense, the black book, I had the same problem. The moment the red book, you know, hit the streets, give it a couple of months of promoting it. I started work on the black book. I threw it out twice because I lost track of my audience. You know, I said I was teaching at Michigan Tech University. Um, You know, I'm getting to the point in my career where I see retirement looming. And I thought, you know, I got to give back something here. So I was teaching, you know, free of charge, um, but teaching a, a graduate course there in part, you know, because I wanted to do the right thing, but also in part because I wanted to develop the content for the Black Book. You know, I went through the whole first semester teaching these people stuff that I thought needed to be taught. At the end of the semester, I looked back on my notes and I said, this is a this is a book that's two and a half inches thick. The problem is that most of it's been written before. You know, I just had a hard time justifying writing, you know, the little piece that hadn't been written before and all this other stuff that had... You know, I, I wrote some outlines. I tried to make some progress. And, you know, I just stalled. Second year came around. I had a second set of students. You know, I got into it um, three, four, five lectures doing basically the same thing I'd done the first year. And I realized, I said, just a minute, these students don't have um, my book. They don't have the new book. It, it doesn't exist. What do they have? They have the diagrams I'm drawing on the on the whiteboard or on the you know the electronic whiteboard a lot of it was remote they have my voice over the go to meeting they have my assigned readings and the exercises that's only this much stuff and so i started writing having figured that out and yeah. you know in the end did not you know the other thing i, I did um work from time to time with uh, with dr art conklin at uh, the university of houston he looked at uh, an early version of the black book and he said you know andrew you're struggling here to produce something that students can use. 
do you really need students to use this or do you need the world full of security practitioners to use this because they're two yeah. different audiences audience again and i said you know i kind of really need the practitioners to see this first eventually it'd be nice if someone produced a book for the students but the practitioners really need to see this first yeah he said stop trying to you know produce lecture notes and you know notes to the professor and notes for you know producing exams and all the rest of this stuff he said you just just write it down and get it out there and do it soon not later and so i did it's all about the audience for me yeah well, that, that, that that's that's some good advice there. What do you think are some just they're trying to think of the, the practical uh, nature of this? What is some writing? Let's say some people could do short of the book. You know, what what are some to to start cracking into that to develop that skill in this industry? Um, any recommendations on where they could start to you know apply that? What I would recommend is get involved with the ISA. The ISA SP ninety nine has uh, you know. I think 14 active working groups, every one of them is trying to produce a new something. You know, I think they just released a guide to industrial control system security risk management. Uh, good for them. It's like 150 pages. It's a lot of writing. Yeah. Um, here is, you know, there's an opportunity to do some writing, have experts give you feedback on your writing, yeah. you know, develop that skill. Be, you know, develop it to a point where you can reliably contribute to artifacts like this. It doesn't have to be, you know, I'll take on the first three chapters. That That's not how you do it. It's, you know, we just finished discussing such and so, you know, the, the writing is wrong. I was taking notes. I'd like to take a run at it. I'll come back at you with four paragraphs next meeting. So that's that's one kind of writing that that urgently needs doing. And you know, people are going to get immediate feedback from experts in the field on that's their a writing great recommendation. Yeah, jump right into that process with ISA and and right. uh, be one cutting your teeth and getting the experience, but also being being additive and helpful to the community. Absolutely, and and ISA is a is a community of volunteers. There may be the occasional person there who gets paid by their employer to do this for ISA, but most of the the participants are volunteers. And there's other organizations as well. The one that that springs to mind is the Industrial Internet Consortium. Um, they take members, individual members, but you know mostly corporate members. But again, they're producing advice. They produced uh, a white paper recently on uh, endpoint protection. For the industrial internet, um, I'm helping a group that has kind of stalled out with all of what's going on, but uh, we're supposed to be producing a, a white paper on connectivity. The thing is, we there's already a security framework, but a framework is a checklist. What's the NIST framework? It's a checklist. You know, what is the IIC security framework? It's a checklist of everything you should think about when you think about security. Some of it applies to you. Some of it doesn't. What the IIC is producing now is uh, not just a framework, but advice saying, okay, we've already got the framework. It listed everything you need to think about. Here's what you should really be doing. You should do this first. You should do that next and produce. So, so right now they're working on prescriptive advice as opposed to a, a checklist. So there's, there's always work underway. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great advice. On the kind of career path thing, I always like to ask guests if you could go back uh, to your younger self. And you kind of already maybe foreshadowed this a little bit or even mentioned a few things. What, what advice would you give uh, younger uh, Andrew Ginter? The one mistake that I, I think I made in my career path is that when I went back to get credentials in, you know, what turns out to have been my field of choice, computers, I went back at age 29. 29? Yeah, 29. And signed up for a master's program. And that was great. So, you know, two things. One is don't wait that long. One thing I learned during the master's program is that it is very, very different from undergraduate work. You know, in undergraduate math, I was doing proofs. I was doing assignments. I was, it felt like taking a course. In graduate school, you study what is interesting to you. Half the courses are courses. You have to take a couple of courses. But, you know, half the courses, your prof will design for you and say, OK, in order to get your thesis written, you're going to need to learn this stuff. So let's put a course together called this and you'll read this much paper <laughs> and become an expert on this field. Yeah. And you'll do your your experiment for your thesis and you wind up working on a topic that you love. And not 
taking countless courses all over the place in you know topics that you may or may not be interested yeah. in. So I would I would recommend if you are well and thoroughly tired of school by the end of your undergrad, think hard about taking no more than a one year break and coming back for your master's because you may be, I certainly was very surprised at how much fun it was. It's it's very different being a, a thesis oriented master's student from a course oriented undergrad. That's a that's a I think that's a nugget today too then. I think for people who haven't gone on beyond uh beyond their their undergraduate degree, they may not get that distinction that hey, this could be a totally different experience, less proscribed or entirely less proscribed and an opportunity to explore and to delve into areas of real interest versus something somebody else's area of areas of interest. So that's that's right. But if I may, there's just one other piece of advice that has to do yeah. with grad school, and that is I went back after seven years in in uh, in industry, and I had some very clear ideas on what I wanted to study. I was into programming languages. I wanted to study interpreters, and uh, so I went into the into the program looking for a, a supervisor who would let me do my own thing, and I found. A supervisor, Dr. Anton Cullen, and you know he provided great advice in terms of the uh, the caliber of my work. But he let me choose my own direction. In hindsight, that was a mistake because it took me two and a half years to get my master's. By which time I had a little girl, a baby, and I went back to work. Thank you. But it turned out that the first year I'd spent in my master's. Most of that year was spent learning enough about a field to be able to intelligently choose a research topic. This is not a requirement for a master's degree. This is a requirement for a PhD. For a PhD, you're required to choose your own topic. You're required to do self-directed research. To get your master's, all you need is to to demonstrate that you can do supervised research. So what I should have done was go to a uh, a professor, Dr. Colin or someone else, and ask the question, what have you got for me? Find a project that's interesting to me, have them tell me how to do the research, do the research, and execute supervised research, get my master's in 12 or 18 months, or better yet, halfway through transition to a PhD program. But don't do 90% of the work for a PhD, namely, learn about the field, choose your own area of interest, execute the research, write the thesis. Don't don't do that, learn about the field, choose your own area of of research. That's a requirement for the PhD. If you're going to do the work of a PhD, you should get a PhD. I thought, you know, to continue for another, another couple of years and get a PhD, but I had a little baby girl. So I said nuts to that. But you know, in hindsight, if you're going to do a master's, get your project and be out in 18 months. If you want to choose your own project, plan from the beginning to do a PhD, to transition from the master's to the PhD halfway through the program. Great advice for anybody who's looking at that that system. That is very good, practical. Been there, done that advice. Okay. Well, anything else you want to, you know, words of wisdom you want to pass on uh, here at the at the end of our discussion uh, to to the workforce? Sure. So, um, what I will say, especially to people who are getting started, um, a couple of things. One is uh, the industrial security space is a difficult one. There's a reason there's comparatively few of us. It's because you need to know a lot. You need to know industrial systems. You need, you know, you need to know something about the physical process as well, a degree of, of some of the, the engineering knowledge. You need the uh, networking and connectivity knowledge. You need host and operating system knowledge, and you need security knowledge. So it's not surprising that there's not many of us. It, there's an enormous amount to learn. Be ready for that. And I guess so the sort of concrete advice that's linked to that is buy the books, read them all. There's a lot of stuff out there, comparatively, certainly much more now than there was 20 years ago when I got started. But even when I got started, you know, I read the books of the day, which were IT security. I read Practical Cryptography by Bruce Schneier. I read I read everything I could. It's it's one of the ways to come up to speed. So read everything, you know, read widely. You need a certain level of depth in engineering, in networking, in operating systems, in 
SCADA systems, control systems, SCADA protocols, and eventually intrusion detection, you know, host uh, uh, intrusion agents and so on. So, you know, eventually working into security, but but you need to read somewhat deeply across a wide spectrum of, of knowledge base. Okay, this is the fun part of the show. I always enjoy doing this where I get to uh, tip my hat a little bit to one of my favorite television shows inside the Actors Studio. Long-running, uh, multi-decade show syndicated in many, many countries. It was hosted for a long time until he passed recently by James Lipton. And this is a show where he would introduce, uh, interview famous actors in front of a studio audience of actors. And so I've taken to doing this with entrepreneurs, but I'm now also doing this with the security leaders. So it's kind of a fun uh, dimension. So if you're ready for this, this is um, actually borrowed by James Lipton from a French show. It's called The Pivot Questionnaire. So it goes all the way back to a show before, you know, before Inside the Actor's Studio. So this goes back a long way. And if you're ready, I'll take you through it. All sure. right. Go for it. What is your favorite word? My favorite word? Holy smokes. <laughs> Helix. Oh, ooh, good word. Uh, what is your least favorite word? My least favorite word was my least favorite thing. Calisthenics. This never fails to be so interesting. Uh, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Storytelling. Hmm. What turns you off? I don't know. I, uh, I've i been blessed in that I'm easily entertained. <laughs> so um, what turns me off? I, I don't know, bigotry. I just uh, I, I have a low tolerance. Yeah. If you're willing to share, what is your favorite curse word? <laughs> <laughs> The one I use most frequently is probably shit. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Sound or noise do I love? You know, beyond the sound of my own voice. I love the sound of the road. I like I love driving. Oh, good one. What sound or noise do you hate? I don't know. I guess the sound of a breakdown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really turns me off. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Teacher. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? The best I could hope for is you did good. Um, you know, uh, not perfect, but, but uh, you know, I saw your work at it. All right. Thank you, Andrew Ginter, VP of Industrial Security, author, Industrial Security podcast host, a man of many talents from Waterfall Security. Thank you, Andrew, for being on the show. Thank you so much. Catch you later.